So this is Wisconsin. <laughs> I know here with the clouds and the, the weather, you don't realize that, but it looks that way. All right, so I wanted to talk about today um, a topic that's a bit different. Um, it's more of a nuclear engineering topic, but I'm kind of a closet mechanical engineer, so most of this will be about mechanical engineering applications within nuclear engineering. Um, just to give some credit, Jeff Bull is the doctoral student that's done most of this work. Jason Oakley is a research scientist that has been doing some of the CFD work that I'll mention. I have extra slides if we have time to talk about it, but I, at the very end, I need to couple it to the real application because us engineers that do stuff in the lab uh, kind of loathe the real application. We always want to just be in the lab and have some fun. And Eric Van Abel is a, a, an alum of the university, but is also an employee of the company that actually funded the work, Shine Medical Technologies. So I've broken the talk into three pieces. One piece is to tell you why we're doing it. One piece is to tell you about the technology that actually has come out of some disclosures and patents out of Wisconsin that formed a couple of companies. Uh, one was Shine, the other one was Phoenix Nuclear Labs. And then finally, we'll get around, hopefully soon, uh, since the early part is nuclear engineering, and I get kind of nervous when I talk about nuclear engineering, to uh, an application which is heat transfer and fluid mechanics, which is kind of the fun thing involved in all this. All of you that do fluid mechanics and heat transfer, raise your hands. Good, two or three, good. I feel better now. So, uh, technetium-99 is a most common medical isotope. About 85% of all procedures are done with technetium-99, something on the order of about 30 million procedures worldwide, maybe 30 to 35 million. Um, it's made in generators today using the decay of molybdenum-99. Most of you know this. And at least in today's world, most of that is done by essentially taking highly enriched uranium targets and irradiating them in, in a couple of different reactors. I'll show you the reactors. They're older, one's in Canada, one's in the Netherlands. There's some work that's done in South Africa. But it turns out they're foreign reactors, and for reasons that um, we'll get to have proliferation issues and waste concerns. So DUE about now, it's been about five years ago, uh, actually commissioned a study with the National Academy of Sciences, worried about this whole area, and they decided to fund cooperative research in a couple of areas primarily to provide a domestic supply of molybdenum-99. And so I have this kind of strange number here, which is the 3,006-day curies, which means what they want to be able to do is to provide about half of all the world's supply of molybdenum-99, because about half of all the world's use of molybdenum-99 for imaging purposes is done in the U.S. And 3,006-day curies is a fancy way of saying whatever you produce it takes about six days to get to the hospital after I essentially take it out of the reactor or take it out of the, the generator, separate it into little pieces that I need for the, the appropriate doses and get them to the hospitals around the country. So that's where this came in. So it's got to be that after six days of transport and reprocessing. The NAS did a study, I think it was published in 2012, 2011, 2012, where they suggested a number of new technologies to consider. And so I'm going to talk about one of these, which kind of was an outgrowth of an interesting discovery. But as I ended it off here, there have been a number of these. Four of these have been funded. The one I'm going to talk about is a partnership by a company called Shine Medical Technologies, which is actually uh, started by a bunch of our graduates. It's based in Madison, obviously. And MIR, the Mortgage Institute of Research. This is an odd sort of thing. The university has a 5013C, which is a public-private partnership, which is not part of the university, but is actually situated right next to the university where we can do work that is proprietary, classified, that you don't have the strictures of a normal public university. So Shine and Mir basically put in a proposal with uh, Phoenix Nuclear Lab, won the proposal from the NNSA. It was about $25 million. Uh, it seems to be that's what the NNSA funds these days in increments of $25 million. And, and we were one of the four programs uh, selected for the funding. Where we fit in, Madison fits in, is that we were one of the subcontracts. So all we are is a lowly subcontractor. Some of you know what that means. Los Alamos, Argonne, as essentially laboratories are going to do some work. I'll show you some of that. And we did some work that was essentially not using the real materials, but similar materials to try to look at some various aspects. I told you the reactors are older. 
This is the NRU reactor at Canada. It's easily over 50 years old. Anybody been to Chalk River? Beautiful black flies, mosquitoes, all right? It's a wonderful place. Um, so NRU is up there. It's probably easily 60 years old. The Petten reactor is around 50 years old. These are the two sources for most of the living 99 worldwide. There's a small facility in South Africa that's trying to grow in terms of capacity. So I said a lot of this. It's an essential ingredient for uh, a number of pharmaceutical diagnostic tests. I couldn't remember the number. I said 30. Around 40 million scan procedures are performed each year. It's a whole range of things. I had to look up on, 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 on the web because I'm not a medical person. But essentially it comes out, if you take the molybdenum 99 out, in the decay it comes out to an isomer of technetium 99 and it comes out as an oxide. And you can use that in certain testing and then you can actually take that and then link it chemically to other things. There's a fancy word called lignin, uh, uh, a ligand, and then you can actually do other testing for other parts of the body. So such as stress tests for heart disease, cancer screening. So it's an imaging agent that if you can properly, very uh, cleverly, chemically link it, you can essentially inject and then look at various parts of the body as you're preparing for potential uh, surgeries. Now, eventually we get to money, I'm sorry, but it's a potentially large market. And so this is what really was uh, pushing it. And sales are growing because it's being used in a lot of medical procedures. The issue really is that um, in the last few years, because NRU and Petten have been going up and down, partly due to reliability concerns, partly due to safety concerns. If you tend to follow this in Canada, there was a short time when the NRU reactor shut down and they probably weren't going to bring it back up. It actually, the equivalent of the NRC there, the CNSC, decided that they would essentially, uh, um, I'll, I'll say, give an exemption to their normal rules to allow the reactor to come back up to pro producing the radioisotope again. So it's been an unreliable source. The other part of it is there's a, a strong push by the U.S. and a lot of the developed countries to essentially try to get away from using HEU targets because that essentially says that if we can do it, others can do it for proliferation concerns. So the whole thought is, one, they're unreliable and older. Two, if we can get around HEU targets, try to find a way to use an LEU source for this. And so I already said Congress had some response. They passed a bill. It was actually, a, uh, as everything in the United States, it, it kind of snuck in with a budget bill, right? It was attached to one of the budget bills in 2012 and the uh, American Medical uh, Isotopes Act was passed and the goal of this basically is to authorize essentially new innovative technologies so that within eight years we can get away from using HEU targets for radioisotope production. Uh, I was at lunch with Professor Fleming and Professor, where did he go? Professor Larson, we were talking about, we were talking about this and so this is not the only medical isotope, but this is one of the largest ones. So this is really the big push in terms of uh, concept. Okay, so that's part one. This is why we care. Part two is, what is the particular concept? So this is a cartoon. Uh, it turns out this company is a startup company. It's been around for maybe three years at most. They got some initial uh, venture capital funding, and then they were lucky enough to win with MIR, this grant from NNSA. By the way, if you win something with the government these days, it's a 50-50 match. So they won 25 million, they have to raise 25 million. So it's the typical sort of uh, a commercialization approach. So the approach here is, is actually relatively simple in concept. It's basically a high intensity, simple accelerator that induces fission in a subcritical arrangement. And so here's the arrangement, here is the accelerator. Everything's a cartoon picture these days, but it looks fancy, but it's a cartoon. Essentially, the accelerator essentially uh, has a, a deuterium-tritium target in the center of this. I'll show you a cartoon. You're never going to see the real thing since it's a proprietary design, but the, the accelerator is, is you're essentially accelerating uh, deuterium uh, ions into a DT target. You essentially have fusion reactions. Surprise, you actually have fusion. And you produce neutrons, high energy neutrons, which then hit a multiplier and then into an aqueous solution, which is subcritical. So it's, it, although it sounds complicated, it's actually relatively simple in concept if you can get the accelerator going. So that's kind of the secret sauce of this, which we shan't talk about. I have a pretty picture, but that's about it. The solution vessel, what is called the target solution vessel, is really more of a chemical reactor. You induce fissions here. 
you then have molybdenum produced by the fissions and then at an appropriate time you take it out, you clean out the molybdenum, you then go through the normal uh, back end processing proce procedure. And then you can essentially reuse the solution after you clean it, put it back in and repeat the process. So it's essentially a batch process, right? A batch process which is really a nuclear chemical process. You have to have various things that work. You have to have an accelerator driver that works, a, a reactor more in the chemical engineering sense of the word because it's subcritical, and essentially a gas handling system which is probably the hardest thing because you've got to trap all the other little things that come off of a fission reaction in an aqueous solution. Another cartoon picture, so the subcritical assembly is shown here the neutron driver which is the DT source and the concept is simple I said at lunchtime to a couple of folks that if you want to think of this think of this as a trigger reactor it sits in about 40 feet of water except it's not a reactor right it's essentially this uh, subcritical assembly so this whole thing is this whole concrete assembly is filled with water and you basically have natural circulation cooling that you force through the core excuse me the reactor part okay to cool it as life goes on the accelerator is here. This is an example of the beam. This is the real thing. This is built to full scale at, at Phoenix uh, in Madison where they're essentially doing some testing at, at, uh, at their uh, full conditions. So, a little more nuclear engineering and then soon I can get into the world that I feel more comfortable in. So the whole thing of this is that you design this so that under cold conditions you are subcritical, right? So this is just a reactor in reverse. Instead of being under cold conditions, you want to make sure you're subcritical and then you go critical, you're under cold conditions and when you go hot, you become more subcritical, all right? So here we are, K effective is one, we want to be below that, and so the design right now is shooting for something like, under cold conditions, a K effective of about .998, and then as you operate, as essentially you start the process off with the, the accelerator driving it, you induce fissions, you're producing something on the order of hundreds of kilowatts per liter uh, of heat in the subcritical assembly or the aqueous solution. And because you're heating it up, and because you guys all know reactor physics and I don't, right, you get more leakage, it becomes more subcritical, and then you tend to operate it, if life is perfect, at about 60 degrees C and about 0.98 K effective. Okay? By the way, you can stop me for questions, but don't yet. I don't know anything here. I've, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of extra slides. Tom? No, it's, it's about the chemistry of separating mom and nine from Right. How efficient is that? Because that's got to be remote, right? It's got to be remote. Uh, we're using basically the Canadian system. The Canadian, the back end reprocessing is essentially what the Canadians use right now, which is you essentially dissolve. Right now, they dissolve the HEU target in either nitric acid or sulfuric acid and then do a stripping. Pro so all we're going to do is, all we, 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 the collective we, all the company's going to do is take the back end reprocessing step and essentially start off with a, essentially a sulfuric acid solution. So this is uranium sulfate solution. This is what it looks like, right? And it's essentially pH 1, okay? So it's a, it's a highly acidic solution that you then create the molybdenum in that but this would be, a, if I were in the current technology in Canada, this is what they would end up with after they dissolve the target in. Okay? And then they would do through a stripping process. So now you're going to ask me, what's the efficiency? It's 99.9-ish. .9 so like one-tenth of one percent. It's, it's a fairly efficient process. But it's chemical engineers. It's easy stuff. Right? It's not nuclear engineering. Anybody here a chemical engineer? Don't admit it. I'm sorry. I do this to the chemical engineers all the time because they always think they're better than us. I don't know why. Right? So anyway, um, you could use uranium nitrate solutions or uranium sulfate solutions. The, the design here is chosen to use uranium sulfate as the target solution, primarily because it's got good neutronics. It eliminates rapid pH changes. One of the, one of the Achilles heels of this design is you've got to keep everything in solution and you've got to make sure you know what your solution chemistry is very carefully. Okay? And the, the decision was made primarily with um, 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 folks from Los Alamos that, that a, a sulfate solution was a bit more stable over a range of conditions than a nitrate solution. Uh, I said all this. It turns out that the lab people are very beneficial because they get to use large amounts 
of this stuff easily within the laboratory structure, and it's harder for the university to do that. This is the largest amount we've used. I have movies, if we have time, that I can show you some of this kind of at the end. But we've done some very simple experiments to try to see what our surrogates are like relative to the uranium sulfate. But in the laboratory structure, uh, argon in particular with their, with their accelerators are going to probably have uh, what I'll call a, a healthy amount of the material and go through the actual fissioning process by inducing fissions with their uh, electron accelerator. Did I want to say anything else? Only that if you do this correctly, once you reprocess after the batch step, you can then basically reuse the solution. Okay? You can just continually reuse the solution to add to the uranium concentration. Okay. Whew. I made it through 20 minutes and now we're into fun stuff. Yes, sir. I want you to go back one second. Please. Sure. Yeah, so, um, one second. Who oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, who makes the solution? You can, uh, we, anybody can do it if you're allowed to touch the uranium. So, so uh, the answer is, uh, at least in our case, when we've done some of our small experiments, we actually had some from the medical, from the medical school. The medical physics department uses this in some of their preparatory work. But it's not a difficult thing to make. Uh, what you want to get, and again, I. I, I, thankfully, I don't know the numbers, then I'd, I'd say something that's wrong, but it's something on the order of about 100 grams per liter is what you dissolve into, and then you have to become fairly acidic, P, close to pH 1. So the making of it's not the problem, right? It's really the reprocessing of it that's the difficult thing. So it's not hard chemically to do this. The best example of something that we did use in the experiments, I'll show you at my last slide that we're in the middle of doing with the student, is the, the, the best surrogate we found that's easy is Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. So think of magnesium sulfate, except you're with uranium, right? Okay. The, the uh, solution in this case, though, has to be LEU, and you've got to get close to the boundary what is considered LEU to be efficient in terms of production. So they're running here at about 19% uranium-235. Okay? So officially, it's LEU. Officially. Okay? So, the heat transfer challenge is fairly fun. Now we're into the fun part. So I've got this magical accelerator that's sitting up here somewhere, and it's shooting uh, deuterium ions down. I've got this magical uh, target chamber, a little history of the target chamber. It turns out the target chamber was invented by our provost back in the 70s when he was a professor of medical physics. He was trying to develop neutrons for doing KERMA measurements back then, and he came up with this nice idea of essentially taking a, a D target hitting DT gas, all right, and stopping there and then generating essentially fusion neutrons so he could do his physics experiments, just physics, right? But it turns out that this was in the open literature, PhysRev letters, etc., and a couple of our graduates kind of glopped onto this and thought if they could find a way to kind of juice up the performance, they could essentially use this as their, their, excel, their driving accelerator. So it's essentially what you'd find in the open literature, except with some in enhancements. So you come in here, you generate neutrons approximately in a line source, because you're stopping within the gas here. So you're generating like a line source of neutrons that come out. It goes through a multiplier. It then goes into the target solution vessel, which is this highly complex annular thing. OK, it's a bath. It's about t this tall. It's about yay wide, OK? And the whole thing's about this big. So it's relatively small, OK? And then it fissions essentially just as you'd expect in a solid. You produce lots of heat, something on the order of greater than 100 watts per liter. And depending upon the, the production design, I'll show you some of our heat transfer experiments, somewhere between 100 and 500 watts per liter, OK? All right? So it's, it's substantial, OK? And the whole point of this is not safety, at least I'm not going to argue that it's safety, because as I tried to explain, as this continues, you heat up and essentially become more subcritical. So the real issue with temperature is you need to control it because of the production efficiency of the isotope. Right? So the, the, the company cared about us only because we were these dumb mechanical engineers that could do some sort of multi-phase flow to tell them approximately the temperature the whole thing runs at so they could make money. Okay, to put it at a, the base level. I, I hope I'm on camera and tape now. That's terrible, but it's true. Okay, it's true. So in January, the 
If what now? <laughs> right. You, you have to show, no, that's, that's a fair question. You've got to show cold shutdown, oops, you've got to co show cold shutdown within regulatory limits that are being discussed with NRC are some delta below one. That delta right now they're suggesting is 0.998, but they will be told by the regulatory authority that it should be something, okay? Oh. What if it's freezing? Oh, it's never. It, so the question is, what is cold? What is room temperature? In Madison, it never gets below 20 degrees C. <laughs> so you're, that's a fair question. Uh, you're going to have to do some sort of accident calculations. But if it, so I, we could go into all sorts of stuff, but it's safety. And so we could do the what ifs up the wazoo. But since I'm sitting inside a trigger reactor pool, I have a very long time constant of anything that's going to take it from whatever I'm at. But the design is essentially room temperature, right? Design is room temperature. For the cooling bath, I've got to be careful what I'm saying because you ask a very uh, fair question. So here, this is going to be coming down to something on the order of 20 or 25 C. The surrounding pool has got to have essentially an ultimate heat sink temperature around 20 C so we can cool it to that, okay? So probably the harder question is, what if I have a loss of power and I, start, I stop cooling and then I start cooling? So you can come up with all sorts of scenarios. But that's accidents. Call me back in a year or two, right, after NRC asks all the requests for additional information, right? But everybody gets the general picture. Okay, so when we entered into this, the, the focus was primarily on questions related to performance. So, oh, and I didn't say this, and I, and I apologize, I should have said it right here. Because this is a fissioning uh, environment, I'm going to have radiolysis. So the interesting thing is not that I heat the pool, but the fun stuff, if you're in multi-phase flow, which is really the only fun thing to do in, in today's world, is I create little tiny bubbles, okay? Lots of them, okay? And they're, you, in reality, they're essentially uh, radiolysis, so H2 and O2 dissociate. And those bubbles are formed and then essentially percolate through the pool. And the question is, what do they do to the heat transfer? Are they good? Are they bad? Do they do nothing? So we have to quantify that. And that's the focus of this investigation, is that we're trying to somehow mimic right, volumetric heating and mimic volumetric gas generation, which is tough, it turns out, and then try to estimate what the heat transfer is. So what effect does the production of bubbles in the solution have on the heat transfer to the cold wall? The walls of this annulus are cooled by forced convection cooling from the main uh, swimming pool, right? Very similar to a trigger reactor in some sense, very similar, okay? So the first question is, does the bubble production or flow rate impact the heat transfer? Yes or no, or how much? What is the bubble size, the impact on heat transfer? Does the power density impact the heat transfer process, right? And then does the local heat transfer vary significantly from the average, right? Because I have this thing and it's yay big, and maybe it's different in different locations. And then, eventually, you have to have to something useful out of this. If it was just me and, and the student, we'd stop after the first four bullets and say, done. We had the experiments, we got pretty pictures, we got great data, you know, move on. But eventually, you have to develop a model or a correlation that the company can then use that as it submits its licensing application that, that somebody believes. Okay. So what's been done in the past? Now it may surprise some of you young people, they're mainly young in here, I see some more mature types over here, that the young people that this was done back in the 40s, right, at Los Alamos and at Savannah River. So Los Alamos had SUPO, well they actually had LUPO before they had SUPO, but SUPO is the, the souped up version of LUPO, and at Savannah River they had whatever this stands for. Solution reactors, okay, where they essentially went totally critical and tried to maintain criticality in an aqueous solution, okay? And so this is what SUPO looked like, this is what uh, KEWB looked like. I have films of those too, they took films in the old days too. A little bit grainy, a little bit black and white, but if we have time we can show you those too. But it's kind of interesting because in the real case when they went critical, this thing is not stable. That is, I bring it to criticality, I produce this H2O2 solution of gases 
and you all are, this could be an oral exam, you all fairly well know that the moment I start producing gases, I increase, I decrease the density, increase the leakage, and the damn thing goes subcritical. So it just starts oscillating, right? And then it sloshes. And you have all sorts of fun stuff that if you're a regulator, you go, you know, what if, okay? So the main purpose of this design was not to go critical, was to keep it subcritical so you could control the process. But these were two critical reactors back in the 40s. So that's been done in the past. We actually have, in fact, I, I should have pointed out, we actually have very precise amount of information relative to the, the radio, radiolysis in nitrate solutions and sulfate solutions based on those old Los Alamos experiments. So the next piece of the puzzle is, gee, you know, did anybody, for God's sake, ever do heat transfer in a volumetrically heated pool with gas generation? And of course, in the world of nuclear reactors, the answer is somebody did something somewhere sometime. Okay? And so Frank Kalaki, who used to be at uh, 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 Ohio State and is now retired at Minnesota, and uh, Dick Goldstein did some experiments where they were looking at essentially, it's a very small test section about yay by yay, where it's volumetrically heated with gas generation and without gas generation, and looking at essentially trying to develop a heat transfer correlation from the heated pool to the cold walls. And they had something on the order of a Nusselt number as a function of Rayleigh number. You all know Rayleigh number? Oh, good. Who says yeah? What is it? Good, and it is what? <laughs> That's a good gamesmanship answer, but that isn't what I was looking for. No. So it's the Grashoff times the Pronal number. We all know that, right. don't we? And there's, there's viscosity. Yeah, there's viscosity in there itself. Well, we'll get back to it. Okay, so it's essentially a, a ratio of inertia to uh, buoyancy forces with a ratio of essentially uh, eddy diffusivity and momentum to heat. So it's just ratios of stuff, okay, and dimensionless. So Frank in his work tried to develop a very simple model that could be used from an engineering standpoint for heat transfer in this situation. There were some other experiments where they essentially injected gas, right, the injection of gas here was by essentially little pipes at the bottom. The injection of gas here is from above by Ganguly, where essentially injected to a little bit bigger pool. We did, before we went and ran off and did experiments, because we're, we're scientists, not just engineers, engineers just run off and do something fun, Scientists first look to see what's done, then conclude they haven't done it right, then you run off and do something fun, all right? This is kind of a literature survey of all the stuff that has been happening in the past. So Frank and, and Dick Goldstein's experiments, I told you about Gan Julie, there was some experiments done in 1980 at Wisconsin, again with a nuclear application by David Feldy. David's actually at Oak Ridge in the group that some of you guys are working with. Fair is a chemical engineer back in 62 and so on. And so I give you this and it's the kind of not meant to be read, but it shows you the characteristic geometry. Most of these are short, squat, and fat, right? The aspect ratios, was it air injection? What was, are there no air injection? What was the injection method, okay? What was the void fraction range? And so on and so on and so on, all right? And as we go through this, the conclusion really is that nothing really matched up with what we have, which is something that's about Yay thick, because I said it's an annulus, right? All you guys are the mechanical engineering and you want to say, well, I'll compute the hydraulic diameter. Well, it just turns out to be essentially the distance between the two annuli. And it's about yay tall, all right? So it's very tall, high aspect ratio. And that doesn't exist in a lot of these or any of them, okay? So that was something we were worried about. The problem with these and even ours, I will tell you, is that because of the fact that it's volumetric gas generation, that's really difficult to do. We tried. Annalisa. They, Kulaki and Feldy basically made an electrolyte and put on two sides essentially electric current. Right? So they basically just put a I squared R loss through the, the electrolyte. Okay? This, uh, you, you, we get very inventive if we can do things with, with separate materials. We get very inventive. So yeah, in that case it was volumetric. But none of these, if you look at them, none of these had volumetric gas generation. That's kind of the distortion in our experiments that we have to kind of uh, live with, which is it's very hard to make things appear volumetrically. Now you may say, well gee, Coca-Cola does that, but it happens to depressurize. So it doesn't last over 
many, many minutes. So we actually tried some depressurization experiments, but besides getting effervescence all over the lab, it didn't really help us very much. Okay? So we settled on something that took a very particular scaling approach, which I'll show you in a couple of slides, which was we tried to basically do something that was full scale in geometric size, full scale in all the dimensions, and sliced up the annulus. So instead of building the whole reactor target solution vessel, we built a slice of it. Okay? If you look at some of the models, historically, I told you about Kalaki and Goldstein, I told you about Ganguly, Feldy had something, and so on and so on and so on. The most interesting thing that these had that suffered is that none of them went to the proper asymptotes, right? Which is that if I got rid of the gas, I've got to bring back natural circulation. And none of these have this. There was some work done by Blotner. Uh, it turns out why he did it is an interesting story all by himself. But it turns out Fred, I knew when I was at Sandia Labs back in the 70s. And he did it by surveying the literature and saying, it doesn't obey in the asymptotes. I'm going to develop a correlation that essentially when things go to hell in a handbasket, at high gas and at no gas, it essentially comes back to reality. And so here I basically have, the gentleman had it, I have essentially kind of the Grashof number. If I took beta delta t and stuck it out there, that would be the Grashof number, right? So that if, at, if I have no gas and I produce no void, alpha is void fraction. If I have no void, that goes away. I get back natural convection. If I have a high void fraction, I start getting out of bubbly flow into churn turbulent flow, I have a good set of data there, and it tends to behave itself there. In between, he essentially fared in based on data back in the 70s. So keep that in mind because I like that sort of thinking. So our attempt at all of this was to determine a number of things. First, a local heat transfer coefficient as a function of height. So we were looking at h as a function of z. So we were trying to see how, as we cooled this, right, how it essentially would behave. Overall heat transfer coefficient, because eventually this has got to be fed back to the, the, the uh, I'll, I'll use this terrible word, client, the funding agent, the company, because what they need from a design calculation is something to design the machine with. So the overall heat transfer coefficient, the void fraction and the coupling between these, and then because we really want to do this from a fundamental standpoint too, we want to look at some qualitative view of bubble flow patterns, quantitative SM bubble size distributions, right? And try to see how this kind of works, right? And then we'll compare to uh, past models. If I have time, because I want to get to questions, I want to at least show you at least one simulation that we did with some a commercial tool. So this is the, the test matrix space that we chose to do. We did four different flow rates, three different power densities. We, were, we couldn't volumetrically heat the pool with this much. If you do the calculation that if it's something this tall and this wide and this big and I put plates through it to create a current, good God, it's a lot of current. Okay? So we cheated and we basically had inserted uh, cal rods, essentially local heaters. And we just changed the positions of the rods right, to try to so we looked at ver various gas flow rates, various power densities, various positions, and various bubble injection apparatus. Because, again, since we're distorting this, we're not producing volumetric gases, we're not producing volumetric power, we have to kind of change how we do this to see if there's some sort of effect of what we choose to do, right, on how it distorts what we see. All right? And then I set it here, and I'll come back to it at the very end. I do have some data. We're now doing additional testing with Epsom salts. Plus, we have some beautiful soaking baths. Okay? So here's my cartoon again. So what we chose to do is to build this thing. And basically what we did is we basically took a 112 slice, 112 slice so a 30 degree sector of the 360 degrees. We built essentially cooling plates on the inside to mimic what might be the cooling rate on the inside. And each one of these is a little itty bitty heat exchanger where we can monitor temperatures in and out. We can monitor, I'll show you in the next picture, the local temperature of the surface and then try to back out the, the interface temperature, both on, the, on two sides. And then we had essentially an open side, a plexiglass and other two sides where we could take it off after experiment and kind of observe what's going on. Right? And then, of course, you've got to kind of build it. So there's got to be bolts and nuts and all sorts of fun stuff 
so that it actually doesn't fall apart. By the way, this is kind of heavy. When we first did this, the student thought, I can do this by myself. But this weighs about 400 pounds, right? Because you've got, you've got, the, uh, you've got the steel plates, which you've got to build to match up what you think is going to be the inside of the target solution vessel. You've got the aluminum plates and the heat exchangers, and it starts starting to weigh a lot, okay? So you always need help, or else it falls on the student. We have a picture of that, too, but I'm not going to show you that, okay? So each of, the, each of the cooling plates is like a little mini heat exchanger. The flow comes in, goes around and around and around, and goes back out, around and around, and goes out. By creating this kind of tortuous path, you get relatively close to a constant temperature on any one of the plates, right? And then we can either gang them, the eight plates on either side, we can gang them together and do a, a delta T as if it's essentially cooling through it, just like we'd have, or monitor the temperatures of each one of the plates. We then insert through the center essentially a thermocouple which then comes and touches the inside steel plate so we can monitor that and then determine the local heat flux by both a coolant energy balance and essentially a local, uh, uh, like a thermal pile measurement, and then uh, lots of plumbing. The hardest thing to do was to essentially develop the, um, the uh, air injection. So we used three different techniques. One, we had a gas bubbler. What's a gas bubbler? Kind of what you see in an aquarium, okay, with a bunch of little holes in it. So that was like the super cheap solution from Home Depot, okay? The next level was is that it turns out that you can, that's the bubbler. It turns out that there are folks that make what is called porous diffusers. These aren't cheap. By the way, uh, this looks kind of strange because you say, well, why the hell do you have it in the form of a cross? Because remember, we have heaters, so the heaters have to go through somewhere. So the heaters are sitting basically in the outer portion, so we kind of have to maneuver around the heaters. Diffuser, which is essentially a porous, a porous substance, usually like a, uh, a, brass, a brass porous plate, right, which we use to essentially inject the gas. And then finally, uh, the, the simplest of all things is what is a porous grass, uh, glass frit. In a lot of aquariums, they have these bubblers that kind of look like little balls, and they produce incredibly small bubbles. And what we're after is how small the bubbles are. So I haven't talked to you about this, but you don't know what the bubble size is, and yet you're trying to simulate it. And so from what we could tell from the old Los Alamos experiments and what we computed based on the nuclei concentration of the fission gases coming together to nucleate, we were guesstimating that the bubbles ought to be at birth something less than a millimeter. Okay, so a few tenths of a millimeter. And so you're struggling to get as small a bubble as you can. So we were struggling with these very things. So that we had a porous glass frit where we essentially made like a little uh, picture frame of all of these little aquarium things. Sorry. It's very high technology, okay? So we did all these various ways, and we got something that looks like this. So as a, is that me or is that your screen? Somebody drew on your screen. It's a screen. Okay, fine. It must have been a physics professor. So here is, as a function of axial position, essentially the heat transfer coefficient, right? Uh, as a function of position at four different gas flow rates, one, three, five, and seven liters per minute, right? and at a particular power density of 400 watts per liter, okay? And so all I want to get across in this short time is it monotonically increases, it's not a big change, right? And it does what you'd expect because as I'm essentially creating more and more circulation and agglomeration and mixing as I go up, the heat transfer coefficient goes up. As I increase the power, the heat transfer coefficient goes up. Yes, sir? Did you say it's monotonically It seems to be. You're looking at this one? Oh, that one, the X has disappeared. I don't know where it went. This is, yes. That turns out to be an interesting thing. Well, you didn't have to see that so early in the talk. Could you have waited? <laughs> but that's right. We'll deal with it. So it turns out that we thought that was a, an error in the thermocouple. So we took out the thermocouple, we recalibrated. Then I, I threatened the student because I'm sure he was drinking that night. It, it, was a, it was a hockey night or something, I'm not really sure. 
But it turns out that as best we can tell that's real and probably you get some sort of enhanced circulation in that region that creates a local pocket. And it doesn't necessarily stay there, but it just turns out in this test series on the left side in the second level at about 20 centimeters, it's a little bit higher. Okay? So I can't really explain it to you other than I think it's probably real. It's not totally fake. Right? Okay? So now, let's keep on going. That's good. That's good. Keep on going. So now the next thing you might say is, okay, you gathered a lot of data, which we did, and I won't show you all the data. That gets a little bit boring. The next question you say is, well, how does our data match up with all those models I told you about? I won't comment. Okay? Right? So they kind of don't work. Right? They kind of don't work. So what we, what we thought about, so th there's Ganguly's, Feldy, Hart, Fair, Blotner, Data. Okay? Now, if you look carefully, with no gas down here, we've got data, so natural convection. And as soon as we have a little bit of gas, itty, itty, bitty, bitty of gas, essentially a half a millimeter a second of superficial velocity, which is a void fraction of less than a percent, it's a very small void fraction, you jump, right? You jump essentially from 500, you almost double, all right? So that's interesting. Once you start pumping up the flow rate, it kind of flattens out in asymptotes. That's interesting. The only correlation that at least had this in its mind is back to Blotner, where he said it has to come back to natural convection, right? And it has to then come up and, and look at least that it's essentially faring out to a known value at high flow rates, or at high gas, uh, superficial gas velocities. So with that as some semblance of success, we went further to say, you know, it's probably still not right. And there ought to be essentially a multiplier on this. So what we have here is a heat transfer coefficient, a suggested model, where the heat transfer coefficient is essentially, right, we could write this as a Nussel number, right? I can put an L here, I can put an L there, cubit, it all looks dimensionless. I can stick that over here, it becomes a Nussel number, right? You know, it, it has all those proper forms. But basically you have a heat transfer coefficient which goes as the thermal conductivity times the grashoff parental number plus a multiplier, which is essentially um, uh, times a void fraction. And what we found, what the C20 was, is that it really is affected by the power, by the flow rate, etc. And the only thing that made sense is to have we essentially couple it to the parental number. So when we did that, we got this. So at various powers, we did a reasonably good job. Not great, but a reasonably good job of, of essentially reproducing the data. Okay? And I've skipped, I'm going to skip a couple slides since we're at the, almost close to the witching hour and to give you some chance. So the next thing we did was, is well, you know, that's really wonderful that we have a correlation, but can we predict it? So what we did is we had a scientist, Dr. Oakley was uh, part of the team, and he was doing some other work for the company. And what I asked him to do was basically to take an approach by taking fluent, which is his basic model, which is, now I've forgotten the, the proper terminology for it, I think it's the mixing model, and basically try to mock up the complete experiment. So basically model the heaters, model the injection point, model essentially the cooling plate, the whole thing, right? and then try to see if he could reproduce right, what we saw. And so here is essentially his simulation where he tried to develop a correlation from his simulation in comparison to the exper experiments, spelled wrong, don't look at that. All right. uh, what C10 is and C20 is here. And what he came up with was that the suggestion was that we should essentially have a form that looks something like this, right? just like I had shown you. And where Pronal number is to the 3 halves power. And it's good, it's not great. Actually, the data is a little bit better in terms of the correlation fit, but it at least tells us that we're in the ballpark. Okay, so what are some of the current observations? And then I have one slide, one slide left, so we have some time for questions. So current observations, what's the effect on bubble production? Bubble production, flow rate impact on heat transfer. The production of the void is creating augmentation, you don't need much bubble production to essentially create a circulation current which really doubles the heat transfer. 
we can essentially connect void to superficial velocity based on our gas injection, which allows us to estimate heat transfer. Does the power density impact the heat transfer process? Yes. But it turns out whether we use two heaters, four heaters, short heaters, long heaters, fat, small, whatever, as long as we keep the power density as part of this uh, um, modeling, which comes out in terms of the pool temperature, because remember I said to you all that essentially all of this is driven by the pool temperature. So in some sense, this heat transfer correlation or model, like all things that are natural convection, are essentially iterative. You have to know the answer to get the answer. Okay, But the power density does impact the heat transfer. Does the local heat transfer vary significantly from the average? The answer is yes, but it really seems to be a second order effect. If we can go after the average heat transfer coefficient or the average heat transfer rate, we're pretty good in terms of modeling the process. And then do previous models help for this scenario? Past models kind of fail, but thanks to Blotner's in terms of how he did it, he captures the effects and that's where we went with it. And the final thing is, what is the bubble size and the impact on heat transfer? So we really don't answer that. Remember I started this whole thing off by saying that we did not do volumetric gas generation and we did not do volumetric heat generation. What we did is we did what we could, which was essentially uh, equal, amount of volumet uh, equal amount of gas generation, not at a volume but at a, at a position at the bottom of the test section. We did not do volumetric heat generation, rather what we did was essentially a series of heater rods that essentially then tried to mimic volumetric. But, so that seemed to be okay. But the one thing I said to you, which I have tried to avoid and nobody's asked a question so far is, what's the real bubble size? Okay? And the answer is we don't know. Okay? And the honest answer is we don't know. We don't say that to regulatory. I hope nobody's listening at the NRC. Right? <laughs> sure. But to be honest, we don't know. Right? We really don't know. We have to do real material experiments, which are now being done at Argonne, where we try to induce a fission in a, in a uranium sulfate solution. But we think, based on past data, based on calculations, that it ought to be about less than one millimeter. And then the second, the other thing that we did, and nobody asked a question about, was, well, you're using water. What does water have to do with uranium sulfate solution at a pH of one? And the answer is, well, Maybe it's not. So we're in the process of doing experiments with magnesium sulfate. So magnesium sulfate is not uranium sulfate, clearly, but it tends to have all, at least based on what the literature says in terms of thermophysical properties and thermodynamic properties, reasonably similar properties. And what we've been doing is essentially a whole bunch of experiments with our various things now with this. We've done it both with PA, you can't read this, but this is this is glass, diffuser, tubing, all about the same with water. So water is with a void fraction up to about 2%. And then here's magnesium sulfate, pH 7, pH 1, right? And interestingly enough, it matters. It matters a lot. We double the void fraction, okay? We double the void fraction. Why do we double the void fraction? So I have some pretty movies, but given I wasn't sure what we had here, this is with pH 1, magnesium sulfate. This is essentially with water. The scales aren't the same. This is 5 millimeters here. The bubbles here are clearly less than a millimeter. They're more like uh, 2 tenths of a millimeter if you try to film it and, and count. Here is some counting statistics, right? So here's the uh, distribution function for 230 watts per liter at 3 liters a minute with a bubble size distribution from a diffuser, right? with water, with uh, magnesium sulfate solution. These are like fractions of a millimeter. These are about a millimeter. So you get a very big difference in bubble size. Probably the most interesting thing, and I can only show it to you in a movie, is that these, the magnesium sulfate bubbles, don't agglomerate. They all stay about the same size, and they just kind of meander through the solution. And I remember my student calling me, saying, come quick, something's odd. And so you go to the experiment and you can see the experiments with water and you have bubbles that agglomerate as they percolate up and you get a certain heat transfer. And with these guys, they all just stay there. All right? And the best we can tell from chemistry and looking in the literature is that because it's a magnesium sulfate solution and we have anions and cations, 
most likely the sulfate ions are crowding around the interface and essentially keeping it, a, essentially the equivalent of a very, of like a, a pseudo surface tension, keeping these things nice and stable. And so you don't see a lot of agglomeration. And because you don't see a lot of agglomeration and because the bubble size are small, they move slower. Because they move slower, I get a higher void fraction. Because I get a higher void fraction, I get a different heat transfer. So we're now in the process of doing all the experiments again with magnesium sulfate so we can look at a comparison. So with that, we'll stop. I have a lot more slides, but that's enough for now. Thank you.